All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Tom Barnico, Director of Basketball Training for the Tri-City Area Officials Association. Uh, just got done watching Tom Brady fall at the hands of uh, a Lion legend, Matt Stafford. Excited to see Mr. Stafford get a chance uh, to actually go deep into the playoffs. So a uh, very exciting game to watch. One of the best finishes that I've ever seen in a football game. Hopefully everyone was able to catch some of the game. Um, so <clears throat> the blog post for this week is going to be talking about uh, the different types of technical fouls. And I actually want to thank John Flicky for reminding me uh, that I had this on my list. And for some reason, I skipped over it a couple of weeks ago. So uh, thank you, John, for reminding me that I did want to talk about this. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get into uh, the nuts and bolts of the different types of technicals. Now, um, you know, I, I think there's probably three or three or four vlog posts that you could make out of d differentiating between technical fouls, uh, flagrant fouls, intentional fouls, and maybe somewhere throughout the rest of the season, you know, I'll maybe cover flagrant fouls and intentional fouls in a different blog post. Um, but for the sake of, of everyone's time and for the sake of uh, hopefully not taking up um, too much mental bandwidth because there's there's a lot of things to keep in mind when we're looking at technical fouls. Um, I'll try to keep this solely focused on on technical on the different types of technicals. So I won't uh, go chronologically through the through the rules book. I actually kind of want to just go um, with, with each with each group out of chronological order um, based on you know some of the nuances and. Uh, for instance, I'm going to start with administrative technical fouls here. A lot of times, you know, a, a, a technical foul on a head coach is pretty standard and straightforward. Um, when you talk about administrative technical fouls, there, there's some more details. Uh, there's some other things that you need to take into consideration. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to take the bulk of the time of the vlog to cover the areas that have those nuances, and then we can kind of investigate other areas along the way. So first, administrative technical fouls. So obviously this is, uh, this covers quite a few areas. The, the first one is not having rosters, starters, uh, and numbers ready by 10 minutes to go uh, before the game. For me personally, when I'm the R, I like to get the coaches and the players together, or I'm sorry, the captains together, coaches and captains together for the meeting at 13 minutes. Uh, that usually takes about two minutes by the time we're done with the captains and the coaches. And uh, that puts us at about 11 minutes. So again, if I'm the R, the, the other two officials can go back ac across the floor. I'm going to stay at the table. And the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that um, if we don't have uh, two books with uh, starters, numbers, names, uh, not necessarily names, but but numbers and you know, numbers and starters are are the key uh, area there. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I can to try to get those numbers and starters added to the book before 10 minutes as, as quickly as possible, whether that's bringing the coaches in or, uh, again, a lot of times the books are already working on it. So it's just a matter of giving them the opportunity to get that information in. But, um, you know, another thing to keep in mind, any changes or any additions that take place during the game. Uh, for instance, if a player needs to be added, if they weren't in the book before the game, the player needs to be added. That's an administrative technical foul. What I would recommend um, officials doing, and I know some officials are probably going to roll their eyes at me and, and cringe a little bit, but um, something that I that I do um, or that I've I've tried to remember to do much better. I, I have forgotten a couple times this year, so I you know the onus is on me to be more consistent with this, but having having the two head coaches check the book ahead of time. Um, I, I think that avails the officials of, you know, feeling a little guilty if they if the the numbers and the starters don't match in the book because you're giving both coaches an opportunity to make sure that every player that is on their roster or that they expect to play is actually in the book. So that's that's just a small recommendation if you if you want to go that route. Um, I know some officials are are, are against that practice. I, I believe in the practice. Um, again, there's just been 
there's one time, one game specifically this year that I can remember that I didn't do it. And I think it ended up fighting me. Um, so with that being said, you don't make the same mistake twice. You will see me when I'm the R asking officials to check the book uh, pretty regularly. Teams now ready to start the half. Again, this is pretty straightforward now. A lot of times when we are transitioning into the second half, you have, let's say you have a team that's down by 20 points at halftime. A lot of times you'll see that team in the locker room until there's a minute, minute and a half left. When there's about two minutes left, that's where I, or hopefully one of my partners, whoever starts making their way to game administration to say, have you notified the team that's in the locker room that there's only two minutes left or a minute and a half left? We want to give them the opportunity to get out in the court. I don't think I've ever worked a game where uh, a, a team has been purposefully delaying their return to the court. <clears throat> so again, we want to do some preventative officiating. And if we can get the team who's in the locker room moving so that we don't have to have a technical foul situation, um, we certainly want to do that. And I certainly recommend that preventative officiating. Electronic communication. Again, you can have the iPad on the bench, but only to keep stats. Uh, am I someone who is going to actively uh, check every two or three minutes to make sure that stats are what's being kept on those iPads? No, uh, but at the same time, you know, if anything seems a little fishy to me, uh, we are well within our right as an official to check to make sure that those electronics on the bench are being used for statistics only and not for communication. Uh, to other people in the gym or outside of the gym or whatever the case may be. Um, not occupying the assigned bench. I don't think I've ever had this happen, but it is in the rule book covered under administrative technicals. Uh, more than five players on the court at a time. Uh, this is why it is so vitally important. If you are not administering a throw in or you're not administering a free throw, or you're not the person who's holding on, or you're not the official who's holding on to the ball to put it back in play after a stoppage. You are responsible for making sure that there are 10 players on the court to start. <clears throat> okay. And as the official who is administering the throw in or the free throw, what have you, you should have eyes on your other two partners before you put the ball in play. Without question, do not assume, do not infer. Just because you counted 10 doesn't mean that your other two partners or your other partner is ready. So with that being said, you know, have the awareness that, uh, you know, counting and sometimes even double counting. I, I had a situation on Friday night where we were coming out of a timeout and the girls were lined up in a stack and I could only see two, two players which meant, and I had two other players accounted for. So that was four total. And, you know, I, I stopped the game because I couldn't see a fifth player. It wasn't until I took an extra step around to see the first, the, to see the fifth player who was standing in front of the stack. So there were actually three players in the stack, but there's nothing wrong with delaying the game for five or 10 seconds to make sure that you actually have 10 players out on the court. <clears throat> Uh, obviously, if a uh, player comes running onto the court, that falls into the category of more than five players, becomes an administrative technical. An excess timeout. <clears throat> um, the, again, this is pretty standard. This is the Chris Weber Fab Five rule. Um, and in, in I've I've heard that some coaches are starting to build this into their strategy where they plan to have a technical foul and they they plan to give the other team two free throws and they plan to have the other team take it out of bounds. I'm not really sure in what capacity that strategy is works, um, but I've, I've heard it now a couple times in the past couple of years. So um, hopefully, uh, I, you know, this, this doesn't become too, too large of an issue because it, it can cause some confusion. But um, again, I haven't actually seen it being put into practice. I've only heard of it from a couple of other officials. Uh, violation after a team warning for a delay. Now this revolves around uh, a player reaching through the plane, through the out-of-bounds plane, when their opponents are have the ball for a throw-in. Okay, If you don't touch the ball or you don't touch the player, but you reach through the plane, that's a delay of game. Another delay of game situation is, like we talked about last week, ball goes through the hoop, 
you as a player on the team that made the basket slap the ball away and, and slap it out of bounds. Now, if you slap it across the gym, that's that's going to be on sporting. That's a technical foul. But if you just kind of slap it away and make it <clears throat> more difficult for the opposing team to inbound the ball, at that point, it becomes a violation for a delay. Okay. Um, so, and, and the thing to remember is you don't get a separate warning for reaching through the plane on a throw in and a separate violation, or excuse me, a separate warning for batting the ball away out of bounds. You get one warning, you get one team warning for delay of game. And then the next warning, or I should say the next uh, incident after that automatically becomes a technical foul. So it's not like you can burn, burn the candle at both ends. It's the first time you do it, it's a warning. The second time you do it, it's a technical foul in any delay of game situation. And then finally, all players not returning at the same time after a timeout or intermission. And this goes back to making sure you have 10 players on the court at all times. So administrative technical fouls are charged to the team, which means they count towards the team foul count. And there is no direct or indirect penalty to the head coach. Okay, so hopefully uh, that is easy to understand. Uh, you know, the, with, when it comes to technical fouls, there's a lot of different types of technical fouls. So I know it can be difficult to remember, um, you know, who gets charged, what, what counts towards uh, the team foul count. Um, and, and then you throw into the mix, the flagrant foul and you, the uh, intentional foul, and it all becomes a very gray area. So that's why I wanted to focus solely on technical fouls here, because I think if we can commit technical fouls to memory, it, it, it makes flagrant and, and intentional fouls a little bit easier to not only understand, but to apply rulings effectively during the game. So um, let's, focus, let's keep focusing on technical fouls here, okay? Um, oh, whoops, went way too fast there, I apologize. Player technical fouls. Now this is 10-3 in the rule book. Uh, changing their number without reporting it to the book, okay? Now, if someone does change their number, they have to report it to the book, the book, the home book, excuse me, the home book has to report it to the visiting book. Um, if I'm the visiting book, obviously I'm telling my head coach pretty much right away that there's a, there's a change, there's a number change. And my expectation, and this is something that I talked to the table about before the game, uh, if there is a number change during the game, let's say there's blood on a jersey and the player comes back in with a different jersey, but it's got a different number on it. Uh, you know, I, I, as an official want to know about that. Um, because again, if that player already has two fouls on them, it's not like their fouls are going to reset because they're wearing a new number that needs to be communicated. Um, both head coaches, both books at the table officials. So I'm going to make sure that everyone at the table, especially the home book and the scorekeeper, the timer, um, making sure they both know that if there's a change, um, we need to know about it, and, and, and the message needs to be spread um, around all of the, the uh, stakeholders for that game. Uh, wearing an illegal number, wearing an illegal shirt. <laughs> I shouldn't have copied and pasted because it says pants. Um, it's shorts is what it is. So wearing an illegal number, shirt or shorts, um, that's a player technical foul. Hopefully everyone knows what face guarding is. That's holding your hands in front of a player's face so that they can't see, um, that is a technical foul. Okay, that is that is a straight up technical foul. Um, a delaying return to the floor. Now what this uh, entails is a player is out of bounds for a throw-in, the throw-in is completed and the player remains out of bounds. They, they, they're staying right where they are or maybe they start running back and forth out of bounds again. In all the basketball that I've played and officiated, I don't know why you would want to stay out of bounds or why you would want to basically run out of bounds before getting yourself in bounds and making yourself available for a pass or a shot or whatever the case may be. But if, if you purposefully delay your return to the court, that's a player technical foul. Uh, grasping the basket. Okay. Now you can dunk 
in a game, but we're talking here about hanging on the rim. Okay. Overdoing it with uh, the theatrics of a dunk. Uh, I had someone a couple of years ago it was a boys game. It was a 20 point game uh, team scores. They run back down the floor. Um, the ball is 80 feet from the basket. And this kid from the scoring team decides he's going to jump up and I guess show off to everyone in the gym that he could jump high enough to grab the rim, but he did it. He grabbed the rim balls, 80 feet behind him, no bearing on the play. That's a technical foul on the player for grasping the basket, uh, slapping the backboard, delaying the game. Now this is, you know, one of the most uh, talked about rules in the game of basketball. That's open to interpretation and official judgment. Remember, you can slap the backboard if you are making a legitimate attempt at blocking a shot, okay? But again, it's up to the official's judgment to determine whether that, whether you slapping the backboard was an actual legitimate attempt to block a shot. Because if it wasn't and you slap the backboard, now you've caused the basket itself, the, whether it be the backboard, the ring, um, the ball might be lying on the basket somewhere. You have caused vibration, shifting, a lot of different things. So if you, if, if the, the, sh the shot blocking attempt was not legitimate, okay, then that becomes a player technical foul. But realistically, I mean, you as a player, as, as long as you are legitimately trying to block a shot, you can hit the backboard pretty hard. Now, if I see a player windmilling, windmilling and slapping the backboard like that, even if it's a legitimate shot attempt, again, I'm using my best judgment to say, is, is that a, an actual basketball move? Okay. A windmill attempt at blocking a shot very frequently uh, does not happen. And I would have to see evidence before the game that um, that particular player chooses to try to block shots by starting with his hand down around his knees and windmilling it back up to try to block a shot. Okay. A lot of times kids are just trying to show off or show how, um, how, you know, they're, they're, they're just, they're trying to get attention. Uh, but again, I've seen a lot of legitimate shot block attempts uh, that are, are pretty aggressive, but they're legitimate, so they're not player technical fouls. Um, everyone knows what unsporting act and conduct means. You know, the, everything from taunting to pushing to, um, you know, getting nose to nose with someone, kind of taking that cheap shot. That's that all falls under unsporting act and conduct. Goaltending on a free throw. I don't think I've ever seen this in the 20 years that I've officiated, uh, but it has happened before, I'm sure, because it wouldn't be in the rule book otherwise. So if you see a goaltending uh, violation on a free throw, uh, count the basket and assess a player technical foul. Reaching through the plane to touch or dislodge the ball. Now, again, this is a little bit different than just reaching through the plane. If you're reaching through the plane and don't make contact uh, with the ball, uh, that's a delay of game warning. If you reach through the plane and touch or dislodge the ball, that becomes a player technical foul. Now, the one caveat here is if the inbounder, the team controlling the ball on the inbounds, if that inbounder holds the ball over the line into the inbound court area, you as the defensive player can grab that ball, try to slap it away. That's not a penalty. There's no penalty for that. If the ball is on the in play side of the out of bounds line. But if it's on the out of play side of the out of bounds line, that's when it becomes either a delay of game warning, if it's reaching through, a technical foul, if there's already been a delay of game warning for reaching through, or an immediate technical foul without any warning, if they uh, reach through the plane to touch or dislodge the ball. Okay, so make sure you, you kind of keep in mind what the act actually is so that you can adjust uh, what, what the fouls look like accordingly, okay? Contacting an opponent during a dead ball. So here's the main crux of the difference between a technical foul and an intentional foul, 
okay? The difference between the two, an intentional foul happens during a live ball. I'll say that again. An intentional foul happens during a live ball. A technical foul happens during a dead ball, okay? So as we kind of go through this, just keep in mind that uh, an intentional foul happens during a live ball. Contact with an opponent during a dead ball falls into the technical foul paradigm, okay? Removing the jersey, and I put pants again. Again, my apologies for copying and pasting. Removing the jersey or the shorts is a player technical foul. Now let's talk about this for a minute. And what I wanna do is I actually wanna bring up, or I, I wanna use the exact terminology that is in the rule book. So give me one second here, I had it earmarked. And of course I lost my earmark, but let's look at 434, rule four, section 34, article two. And this covers players, uh, section 34 as a whole covers players, bench personnel, substitutes, and team members, okay? So this is the, in, in, in my opinion, this is the closest you're going to get to an explanation of when you have a player technical foul versus when you have a bench technical foul in this situation right here, removing the jersey. So let's go to article two. Bench personnel are all individuals who are a part of or affiliated with a team, including but not limited to substitutes, coaches, managers, and statisticians. During an intermission, all team members are bench personnel for the purpose of penalizing unsporting behavior. Okay, so pretty straightforward there. But let's go to Article Three, and, I'll, and I hope you'll see why I'm making this distinction. A substitute becomes a player when he or she legally enters the court. If entry is not legal, the substitute becomes a player when the ball becomes live. Now, focus on this next part. A player becomes bench personnel after his or her substitute becomes a player or after notification of the coach following his or her disqualification. I'm gonna read that again. A player becomes bench personnel after notification of the coach following his or her disqualification. So let's run through a scenario here. Fifth foul on a player. Player doesn't like it. Player is still on the court. Official is walking to the table. Official is walking quickly to the table to report the foul, the fifth foul. The player who was just assessed their fifth foul decides to take their jersey off on the court. Now, are they still a player in the game or are they bench personnel at this point? And I'll give everyone a second to think about that. So, are they a legitimate player in the game still or are they bench personnel? If you go back to what I just read, they are not bench personnel until the head coach is notified by either the calling official or another official that it is that player's fifth foul. Once the coach is notified, that player becomes bench personnel and a different type of technical foul is assessed. So if the player is still on the court and the head coach has not been notified that that player has just uh, recorded their fifth foul. For the purpose of technical fouls, that would be a player technical foul. So we'll talk about bench technical fouls here in a minute. But again, I'm just trying to make the distinction here because we want to remember, and again, I'm, I'm going to read this again or, or give you a paraphrase. The player does not become bench personnel, the disqualified player does not become bench personnel until the head coach is notified that the player has been disqualified, okay? So with all that being said, what do we do with player technical fouls? Well, they get charged to the player. 
number one. Number two, they get counted three separate times. Once for the player personal foul count, once for the player technical foul count, and once for the team foul count. And again, two player technical fouls results in a, an automatic ejection, okay? So remember that you're putting the foul in three separate locations. And the head coach's penalty, no, no penalty for the head coach, okay? So hopefully, I was just taking a look to make sure that I didn't miss anything um, in this regard that I wanted to cover, but um, I think I've covered everything as far as player technical fouls are concerned. So, <clears throat> excuse me, let's go to 10-5. Uh, Head coach. Now, a lot of times this can be relatively straightforward. So we, uh, just like players, we know what unsporting act, what unsporting conduct is by the head coach. Second bullet point, consistently coaching outside of the coaching box. Here's my thing. If you're a step or a step and a half outside of your coaching box and you're still out of bounds and you're coaching your players, I'm not gonna call you out on it. Two steps or more, I'm going to ask you to get back in your box. If you're on the floor at any time, okay, not out of bounds, but actually on the floor, I'm going to ask you to get back into your coach's box. If you are out of the coach's box in any way and you are challenging an official, I'm first going to walk you back to the coach's box. And then we're going to have a conversation after that. But if that coach consistently is taking advantage of being outside of the coach's box, and especially if they're doing so just to uh, challenge an official's ability, call, um, the, the, the way that they're administering the game, that's going to be a technical foul, okay? Uh, not replacing a disqualified player as required in 20 seconds after being identified or after having it identified that a player was disqualified and also playing a disqualified player, knowingly playing a disqualified player. Hopefully, you know, you've got a good book and a good uh, scorekeeper, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, timekeeper, and you and your partners are aware enough to know who's been disqualified for the game. So if there are any issues there, um, you can kind of nip those in the bud. Any technical foul on a head coach is going to be charged directly to that head coach, okay? And it's going to count two times, uh, once towards the head coach technical foul count. And again, they get two technical fouls. Um, I'm sorry, they get, this is where it becomes a little murky. They get either two direct technical fouls or they get two indirect and one direct technical before ejection. Now, if, if it goes, uh, Indirect, direct, direct, it's ejection. If it goes direct, indirect, direct, it's ejection, okay? But indirect or direct, okay, just remember that the head coach gets either two indirect and one direct or two direct before they're ejected. And you can see even, even I, as I'm doing this video, have to have to go through it in my head. This is why it's so important. And I always recommend, um, you know, a, a thorough pregame when it comes time to uh, talk to your partners about how you're going to handle technical fouls, because you want to have this knowledge before you go out on the court, number one. And number two, when the adrenaline starts pumping and a technical foul actually happens, um, you know, you're going to need some type of cooler head to prevail. So either you as the calling official or someone on your crew needs to be ready to step up and say, okay, we have this type of technical foul. It goes directly to the head coach. And this is how we're, we're going to resume play. Okay. So let's take a look at another type. And I'm going through this very fast. I apologize. Bench personnel. Now I'm going to go down to removing the Jersey and the shorts. Um, because we talked about this a couple slides ago. Now, if they're bench personnel, so if the coach has already been notified that it's the player's fifth foul, 
uh, that player is now bench personnel. And now they decide that they're going to untuck and take off their jersey. Now they're bench personnel. Okay. So they would get, uh, well, it, it wouldn't really matter. It, it, they wouldn't be assessed a player technical. Um, it, well, they would, but it wouldn't really matter because they've already got five fouls um, and, and they'll be out of the game automatically. Uh, but if they get that technical foul for taking their, let's say they, they take their jersey off while they're bench personnel, so that's one technical foul. And then later on in the game, they decide that they're going to uh, berate an official from the bench. That's their second technical foul. They are ejected and they have to leave the confines of the playing area. All right. So again, just keeping in mind uh, what exactly exists, or I should say what the difference is between um, a player when they're on the court and when they're considered to be bench personnel. Now, I wanted to cover assistant coaches here, and I think this is important because, you know, every sometimes assistant coaches can be just as vocal as a head coach. And if you're like me, you have no leeway at all with assistant coaches. So uh, in that regard, uh, I covered assistant coaches under bench personnel. But if you have um, an issue with an assistant coach, the first time you hear something for an assist, from an assistant coach, I would go to the head coach and say, coach, I need to have all communication from your bench come from you only, not assistant coaches, not players. It has to come from you. Nip it in the bud, 30 seconds into the game if you need to. I've actually done that before. So, um, But if it continues, then you can assess a technical foul uh, to an assistant coach who's considered bench personnel. Now, there is one thing down here that I want to talk about when, when we have a situation with fighting. So let's go through these two special instances, if you will. I guess that's the best way to put it. So the first one, if the player participates in a fight, they are automatically disqualified. So if a player comes off the bench and they participate in a fight, they are automatically disqualified. And that that is like across the board, 100%, doesn't matter if they're a player in the game, if they're coming off the bench, whatever the case may be, if they participate in a fight, they are automatically disqualified. Each player that comes off the bench and participates in the fight is a recorded indirect technical foul to the head coach. Let's read that again. Each player that comes off the bench and participates in the fight is a recorded indirect technical foul to the head coach. So if you have three bench personnel players coming off the bench and participating in the fight, the head coach is ejected. Why? Three indirect technical fouls. Okay. So keep that in mind. If the bench personnel player does not participate in a fight, the individual player is ejected. If they come off the bench onto the court, but they don't participate in the fight, they are still ejected. Okay. Because it is illegal for them to enter the court without permission, as it says in the second bullet point button. But if you have players coming off the bench and they are not participating in a fight, they just come off the bench and onto the floor, but they didn't participate, then only one indirect technical foul is assessed to the head coach, regardless of the number of players coming off the bench that did not participate in the fight. But again, let's say you have seven players on the bench, three of them come off the bench and fight, four of them don't. Four of them stay on the bench. You've got three bench personnel players who participated in a fight, three indirect technicals to the coach. The coach is ejected. If you have three players coming off the bench participating in the fight, and you have the other four players coming off the bench onto the floor, all seven of those players are ejected. And the head coach is going to be ejected at that point. Okay. So, the, the, the key area to remember here is there is some wiggle room. Uh, they changed the rule. I forget how long ago they changed the rule, um, but they are allowing head coaches and assistant coaches to come off the bench without being beckoned now to help break up a fight. So just because a, a head coach or an assistant coach comes off the bench, if there's a fight going on, they are allowing head coaches and assistant coaches to come off the bench 
to help with that fight without penalty, okay? As long as they're not participating. Once they participate, it's a whole nother story. But if they are actively trying to separate players and break up a fight, there's, there's not going to be a penalty there. There is, there is a carve out in the rules for that specific. Okay. Uh, substitutes entering the court without reporting or being beckoned. Um, if they do this, it's charged to the player. It's a player personal, it's charged to the player personal foul account, the player technical foul account, and the team foul account. Okay. And there is no penalty to the head coach for a uh, substitute. Now, again, if I'm working with two other people and there is an official at the table reporting a foul and I see that there are players that are coming in the game without being beckoned, the very first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to try to be proactive and keep them on the sidelines, push them back to the table, not physically, but push them back to the table, say, wait until the official is done reporting the foul, and then we'll, call, we'll beckon you in, we'll call you in. But if, if a player is going to look you dead in the eye and uh, just come on the court regardless, then it's, a, then it's a technical foul against that particular player for entering the court without, being, without reporting or being beckoned. And then finally, we've got pregame dunking. Uh, you know, this usually only happens during boys games, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory what a pregame dunking situation is, grasping the rim and dunking during pregame warmups. This is charged to the player and it counts towards the player personal foul count, the player technical foul count, and the team foul count. And there's also an indirect technical given to the head coach, which is why, uh, you know, usually I, if, if there's a dunk pregame or if there's something that uh, is, is very, it's, is, you know, maybe they don't grasp the rim, but they actually have their arm in their hand above the rim and they throw it down into the, that's a dunk. And I'm calling that because the players need to learn number one. And number two, the coaches need to spread that message to their players that pregame dunking during warmups is not acceptable and will lead to a technical foul. Okay. Um, hopefully this gave you a, a decent overview. I'm sure uh, there will be uh, other opportunities for me to talk about technical fouls, intentional fouls, flagrant fouls. But again, I, I wanted to, to stick only with technical fouls in this situation because of the number of nuances that goes on um, in these types of situations. So hopefully everyone has a good week or had a good week, has a good week coming up as we get ready to move towards February. I know everyone starts getting excited this time of year because Usually within the next week or two, we start seeing some district assignments coming out. So good luck to everyone if you uh, took the postseason exam and are, are looking forward to some postseason assignments. But we will talk again next week, and uh, I wish everyone the best for the upcoming week. Thanks.